Good morning, team. Good morning, Ice. Hope everybody's doing well. It's Friday. It's a great feeling. Uh, this is your PT on Ice show daily podcast, and this is Friday. So, Fitness Athlete Friday. Uh, I'm your host, Joe Hanisco. I'm up here in Michigan, assistant faculty with the uh, clinical management of the fitness athlete team. Um, and today, we're going to be talking about why 90% training at 90% does not always lead to strength gains. So, a topic that um, uh, You'll see I have a little bit of an anecdotal story, too, which is kind of the reason why I wanted to bring this this topic up here. Uh, before we get into the, the podcast today, though, let's go over a couple of upcoming courses here with ICE. We'd like to get you guys alerted to what's going on, and we're doing our best right now to, to feed you guys what you need. So in terms of online classes right now, uh, until June, there's nothing. But in June, we're taking off. We have primary care coming in June. We have persistent pain coming back in June, all online and as well as essentials courses for the fitness athlete, uh, um, clinical management fitness athlete, as well as modern management of older adults. So keep your eyes peeled for June if you're looking for some online content. we got three or four good offerings coming to y'all. Um, and then as well for live courses, next weekend we have uh, out in San Diego, the CMFA team will be out there in California, which is always a good time. Uh, I'm biased with that, but it's always a great course, obviously. And then Extremity is teaching down in Florida, Lake Mary, Florida, I believe it is. They're teaching next weekend as well. And the following weekend in May, the 22nd, 23rd, we have our cervical team going at it. Um, they're doing a double header, so team is split up. Not sure how exactly here, but one uh, we got a crew going out to Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, as well as St. Paul, Minnesota. So, um, you know, May and June, we're packed and we're, we're growing. We're trying to take off, obviously, uh, the last year. So it's been tough to get uh, content out, but we're doing as best we can and um, hopefully you guys are all taking advantage of that as well too. So, so why 90% does not always lead to strength gains. So overview here at ICE, obviously, uh, if you take any of our courses, clinical management, fitness athlete, modern management, older adult, if you're taking extremity or spine courses, at some point we're talking about loading individuals. And I think chronically across the nation in terms of physical therapy, we're, we're, we're chronically under loading people. So we are no strangers here to just sending it and loading people, especially with our our general population out there who really just need to be uh, exposed to their to their strengths and understand that their body is a little bit more resilient than, than I think sometimes we give them uh, the respect for. So we're all for loading here. We're all for pushing people, high percentages, high RPEs to get people strong. Um, and I think, you know, it has its place, it absolutely has its place. And I love it for sure. So traditionally, when we talk about strength training, um, the idea of building strength, like progressing and pushing more weight, um, we're doing a lot of work in, in high set ranges, five to 10 sets, um, and then per set, low rep ranges. They're talking one rep to maybe five reps in that range. So upwards in the, in the sets, downwards in the reps, and then percentage wise, we're looking at 80 plus percent. So, you know, if someone could bench press 100 pounds, like we're looking at doing, you know, sets of, uh, one to five reps in that 80 to, uh, maybe 90, 95 pound range commonly for strength gain there. And that, that is great. I can speak from experience. I can speak from reading. I can speak from just being in the gym and seeing people. If you're looking to move heavy weight, at some point, we need to be pushing those upper percent ranges for sure. Now, that being said, um, you know, when, we, when it comes to athletes, uh, problems can arise if we're only training at 90%. You know, and um, I think this happens for a couple of different reasons. And I, I've seen it in the, in the CrossFit world. Uh, especially people break off, you know, from maybe some standardized programming or doing things on their own. And, uh, you know, after a while of training, uh, you do some reflection, you look down at the bar, you start doing some calculations and you realize that every time you're letting that barbell out, deadlifts, cleans, snatches, what have you, especially in those compound movements, if we're only pushing those 85, 90, 95% ranges all the time, at some point, uh, your body's not going to be tolerating that super well. And we won't see gains, and sometimes we can actually see decline. So it's a good uh, segue into uh, my little anecdotal story here. So like many of you, the last year or so has been interesting in terms of uh, getting some consistency. So up here in Michigan, uh, you know, early on in the COVID process and the quarantine process, our gyms were pretty much shut down. Um, and for a while, uh, a good extent of that was um, just no access to gyms, really. And um, I'm a big barbell guy. I love moving it for the last... 15 years of my life, um, 
pretty much every week. I have a barbell in my hand in some way, shape, or form. And um, I decided, though, that even though I had some access to barbells when my gym was closed down, that kind of broke away from it for a little while and was doing a lot of uh, monostructural work. So just looking to build some aerobic base. I was doing a ton of Metcon work using kettlebells and dumbbells, some, some single arm um, and single leg work, uh, just a different style of training. And I probably took, you know, maybe four or five weeks of doing that where I broke away from my traditional CrossFit style and Olympic lifting style training. And I still had the, the, co- the CrossFit mentality in terms of the Metcons, the AMRAPs and the high intensity work, but it was just different, uh, different tools that I was using. And I did that for a few weeks and um, got the itch back when uh, I had the opportunity to get back into a facility that had a barbell where I could be using it consistently. And I approached it in a, in a good way, in a smart way, I thought, you know, like anybody who has some background uh, had been off for five or six weeks or whatever it ended up being and decided that, you know, going back into especially my Olympic lifts that I was going to work on technique and speed and I was going to stay at lower percentages, the 50s, the 60s, the 70% range. And I was just going to build back in and, and kind of go by feel because I had been away from it for a while and didn't really know how my body was going to respond. So had a couple of sessions of, of that style there. Um, I would say that real uh, systematic and smart training. And then one day I showed up and I was going to be doing snatches. And um, and my thought was that I didn't really know where I stood. I was having a hard time. You know, things had been feeling pretty good. So I just decided to go by feel for a day. And I was going to, I was doing power snatches. And for me, typically pre-COVID, um, you know, my power snatch, uh, you know, the, that upper 90% range was in that, the, the low 200, you know, 205, 210. Those were, those were moving good numbers. 185 was kind of that tilting point where I had to start putting a lot of thought into that snatch. And during this training session that I was going after, um, I got to 185 and the bar popped up overhead extremely fast. It felt extremely easy to me. And it was sort of eye opening and shocking because I hadn't been moving the barbell much. And I was like, wow, that felt pretty dang good. Um, so I move on and I move on and I add a couple more pounds and things just kept being smooth. And I ended up PRing my power snatch, um, after being away from the barbell for nearly a month and a half. And, you know, that's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon that was kind of, you know, things that I understood, but really I, I think it came down to is that, you know, it wasn't that I got stronger, obviously, especially in those just two weeks of kind of building back in, but gave my body opportunity to rest and, um, and, then I, I, this is honestly probably where things went wrong. If I was <laughs> really thinking and, and maybe life was normal at that time, I would have taken that and, and stepped back and gotten back into a training cycle. But just because of sort of the, the chaotic environment that I've been, uh, that we've all been living in the last year, I just kind of rode that wave, feeling real good, started pushing around some heavy weights. My clean was feeling good. My snatch was feeling good. Um, and I rode that for a while and, and things kind of went south because about a month or two ago, I started seeing a decline. So um, that 85, 185 weight for me all of a sudden wasn't so snappy. And I, again, had to put a lot of conscious effort into it. I was still able to maybe to, to get up into that 200 pound range, but it wasn't like it was a month or two before that. And the reflection set in that for the last two months, I was really just, I was training at high percentages for, uh, because it felt good, but I, I was training at high percentages for probably way longer than I needed to be. And I got off track and, um, you know, whether it was subconscious to some aspect, uh, the chaotic environment, my life was, I got a lot of stuff. I'm, uh, opening up a new business and, um, we all battle gym egos. Maybe it was my ego telling me that, dude, this is just, this is how it's going to be. I'm feeling real good right now. I'm just going to ride this wave. Um, we all love lifting heavy. Alan Friendel, uh, you know, CEO of Vice or COO of Vice, I should say said it once where we all want to lift heavy stuff with our friends, but sometimes we just don't know it. Well, I definitely know it. And, uh, maybe that got to me either way. I didn't have a plan and I got away from the plan, which was something that I hadn't done in a long time. Um, so that's sort of my, my story of where this came into why training at 90% doesn't always lead to strength gains because I wasn't training at 90% before quarantine. I took time off, significant time off, made significant gains after recovering and taking time away. And then I lost that because I was always training at high percent ranges up in that 90% range. Um, and I think what I want to try to dive into a little bit too here is, uh, uh, you know, um, a theory or thought process of central nervous system fatigue. So um, commonly we talk about our bodies in terms of joints, muscles, ligaments, tendons, you know, needing to rest these things and, and recovering. But our nervous system is what's in control of all of this. And frankly, uh, 
we only have so many repetitions, good quality repetitions at high percentages. So if you look at, you know, some of the world's best uh, Olympic lifters and, and whatnot, they're not spending a ton of time near their max during their training sessions. A lot of their time is spent working on technique and speed and accessory work in mild to uh, moderate ranges in their percents there. Um, and we can see uh, what, you know, that central nervous system fatigue or central fatigue um, conditions occur. And um, essentially, it's just that, you know, there's different thought processes, but the neural drive, the ability for the nervous system to stimulate the, the tissues and produce the contraction, the power that they need to um, phase after a while it fatigues and we run out of that, that ability and that capacity. We get decreased motor unit recruitment um, and we see a, a, a decrease in performance ultimately. So um, I think this is kind of what was occurring to me partially um, that maybe even before quarantine is that I was probably needing to step back and a reframe because that's essentially what it was forced to do and I end up seeing progress down the road but then after quarantine when I got back into it the CNS fatigue the central nervous system fatigue set in again and that training at high volumes and high percentages was ultimately um, what led to my demise of having to step back and, and get into a program so I have been I've been following a program things have been feeling really good um, so the importance of programming which is sort of the the, the direction I wanted to go here I think programming allows for proper progression and, and tapering and, you know, whether you're using conjugate method systems, whether you're using periodization, like they all have their own thoughts and theories. One may not be better than the other, but uh, we know that we need to be training our bodies in different ways. And I think a lot of our time needs to be spent um, working volume and, and hypertrophy and, and you know, uh, skill and speed training, especially when we talk about some of these compound lifts. So right now my training consists a lot of um, you know, ranges, rep ranges, and, you know, upwards of 15 ish reps, uh, 12 to 15 on the high end, uh, five to eight on the low end and percentage wise, fifties, sixties, seventies. Um, and that's about it. Like maybe mid seventies is where I'm at right now. And, you know, you look at what's on the bar compares to what used to be on the bar. And that's where the ego check comes in where, you know, I was moving, moving heavy weight before and higher numbers. And now I'm moving, lower numbers in terms of the weight on the bar but the challenge is still there and i think it allows me to fine tune things and i'm not sensing that fatigue either uh my body's recovering better i'm honestly feeling more muscular uh fatigue sort of that dom stuff uh, where my i'm showing that my my workouts are actually making a a tissue change i think here too um so it's a completely different phenomenon but i think a lot of our time in our training methodology should be spent in those moderate ranges there um the speed and the technique work is really good. I think that we shouldn't, you know, I see this a lot too in the gym where snatching particularly because it's a challenging movement, but I see athletes sometimes who fail reps just as many times as they succeed a rep. And um, I'm not saying that, you know, missing a rep here or there doesn't happen, especially with a complex movement like a snatch. I'm guilty of it. You know, one or two inches sometimes can make the difference between, you know, receiving that barbell in the right position and riding that snatch down. But I think by reducing percentages, we can improve confidence with lifting. We can improve the speed and the technique and the drill work that will allow us then to succeed when we get back into those 90 percent ranges. So, you know, if you're going to be only spending probably a short one to two, maybe three weeks of uh in terms of the full movements in that 85 95 percent range in that upper percent range and typically if you're if you're looking at a competitor they're, they're building into those higher percent ranges as they get into competition um you know if they have a lifting uh a competition coming up they're trying to qualify for nationals or whatever um that's when they're peaking in those 90 95 and hopefully then 100 or 101 percent to set new prs potentially or records there um but that's not the majority of their training. The majority of their training is spent where we were talking about before in those mild percentages there. So um, so that's sort of a, a, a tie to my own personal experience, and uh, which is great to experience sometimes. I, I, you know, I can sit here and I can talk the talk, um, but I wasn't walking the walk, and it came back and smacked me in the face, basically. And um, it was a great reflection for me to, to sit back and, and figure out that, you know, it, it, it's worth sitting down and, and programming, whether it's paying for somebody to program for you because sometimes that's just frankly easier and there's some high high skilled programmers out there that are doing it really really well or you take your time to yourself and you and design your own program um take an hour or two and sit down whether it's six weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks like you know these are common durations and cycles that we're doing um 
where majority of that time you should be spending on building the base, building the strength, uh, and you know, in those mild to moderate rep ranges there, and and then build into those new percentages, those high percentages, where maybe you start to see that you're actually pushing your boundaries and you're setting new PRs. So, uh, especially with our, our elite lifters, uh, PRs don't come on a daily basis. Right now, I'm training my wife, who is new to strength and conditioning, and have her doing a lot of what I'm talking about right now. And every now and every every week, it feels like she's setting a new PR, even unintentionally, even though we're not even testing PRs, but just even like you know, I have her occasionally do AMRAPs on the last set of, uh, you know, back squat or something like that, where we'll do five by five, but on the last set, it's, you know, max effort. And, you know, so she's making considerable gains and that's typical for the, the new novice lifter here, but for more of experienced lifters, like, I think we really need to step back and, and create our program and, um, and, and trust the process and, and put the ego to the side and make sure that really we're doing it for the right reasons. And I think the, the success will come with that there overall. So as a recap, uh, I kind of wanted to make this short and sweet and, and get into you know, just some reflection. And um, I think the recovery time for both the musculoskeletal system and the nervous system is extremely important. And one that we don't talk about often is the nervous system and how, it, and how its effects are, are probably interlinked to all of it. And um, central nervous system fatigue and central fatigue system is a real thing. There's some great literature out there. Um, and I, I think it's important to monitor those things because if you're starting to see declines or what you feel like you're getting weaker, uh, we need to be checking off our list and making sure we're recovering correctly, training correctly, eating correctly, sleeping correctly to make sure that these things aren't leading to a decline in performance. So um, respect your recovery. Um, following a program is where it's got to be. I think that's just if you're going to be serious about something and you want to not just show up and just to show up. Um, and put your time in and, and find that program. So I sometimes used to be the, the component of uh, anything's better than nothing. And I think to some extent it is. If, if ultimately our goal is fitness and just to be healthy, then getting into the, into the gym is where you need to be. But uh, if you're looking to take it to another level and, and you're interested in your performance, you've got to follow that program to see those, those gains the way we're looking for. I think overloading is much more common than underloading in a gym. Um, I sh at least in my uh, in my bubble, the people that I'm watching and being and working around with that, you know, I think the competition side, the ego gets in the way and we tend to overload more than underload. Um, not in the general population. We're going to be flipping that script for sure. And that's why ICE is here to to drill that method into our, our brains that we need to be loading people and get them strong. But um, be sure to not overload so that you don't run into these issues. But obviously, underloading could lead to similar issues where you're not making progress as well. Um, and I think uh, ultimately, uh, you know, it's up to us as as fitness professionals to kind of to have these thoughts and understand from both sides where, you know, where we can blend into this model and um, and, and help our athletes and our clinics and, and the clients that are we're seeing uh, ultimately perform at their best there. So hopefully this was a, a, a little bit of a reflection for you. Maybe you check into where you're at with your training. Maybe you reflect back on some of your numbers, where you're going. If you're in a program, if you're not in a program. Um, and hopefully we can uh, get you guys moving in the right direction. So enjoy your, your Friday. Thanks for your time. Um, again, this is, this is a PT on Ice Daily Show podcast, Fitness Athlete Friday. Have a great weekend. Hope to see you guys around.
Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.